Have you ever felt like the world around you was moving at such an incredible speed while you were standing still? <clears throat> felt like you weren't going anywhere in life, at least not anywhere you wanted to go? Have you ever asked yourself, is God even at work in my life? Doesn't he see that everything is at a standstill? Or worse yet, does he realize I feel like things are going backwards in my life? It's when we are at these places in our lives that we are in an incredibly dangerous spot. And that's when Satan tries to take advantage of our weakness and the weaknesses of our sinful human nature. They work in tandem, our own weakness and the devil prompting can make for a very destructive mixture. Our lives can take some severely wrong turns and when we become disillusioned, we begin starting to doubt God's involvement. This morning we are going to look in the book of Esther. Esther was an unlikely queen in the Old Testament. Unlikely because she was a Jewish orphan girl who became the queen of Persia. It's truly an account of divine destiny. Of God working in ways beyond humankind's imagination. And yet the Bible is filled with the accounts of lives led and directed again and again by the hand and the will of God. Think of the lives of Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and Joseph, David, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and so many more. If you read the biographies in the Word of God, you cannot help but see God at work in people's lives, especially people who trust Him and look to Him for guidance. We're able to see it in these people's lives because it's in the past. And often it is when we look backwards that we see God's hand working in our lives. It's because of these snapshots that we are encouraged to trust Him in the present time. That He is still alive and well and that He is still in charge. But things have a way of seeming to get worse sometimes before they get better. The story of God's work in the life of Esther begins with her in the background. She isn't even mentioned in the first chapter of this book which bears her name. God isn't mentioned either, not in the entire book. Neither is the devil. But God and the devil are both involved in what is about to happen. And today we look at God's word and we think of wrong things we do when we are angry or depressed or anxious. Open your Bibles this morning. Look with me there, if you will, please, in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 1. Esther chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. These events took place during the days of Asasaurus, who ruled 127 provinces from India to Cush. In those days, King Asasaurus reigned from his royal throne in the fortress at Susa. He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all his officials and staff, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the officials from the provinces. He displayed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendor of his greatness for a total of 180 days. At the end of this time, the king held a week-long banquet in the garden courtyard of the royal palace for all the people from the greatest to the least who were present in the fortress of Susa. White and violet linen hangings were fastened with fine white and purple linen cords to silver rods on marble columns. Gold and silver couches were arranged on a mosaic pavement of red felspar, marble, and mother of pearl and precious stones. Beverages were served in an array of gold goblets, each with a different design. Royal wine flowed freely according to the king's bounty, and no restraint was placed on the drinking. The king had ordered every wine steward in his household to serve as much as each person wanted. Queen Vashidi also gave a feast for the women of King Asherah's palace. 
On the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine, and skip down to verse 11, to bring Vestai, Queen Vestai before him with her royal crown, he wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command that was delivered to us by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. The king consulted the wise men who understood the times for it was his normal procedure to confer with experts in law and justice. The most trusted ones dropped down to verse 15. The king asked, according to the law, what should be done with King Vashti since she refused to obey King Asheroth's command that was delivered by the eunuchs? Memicon said in the presence of the king and the officials, King Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king but all the officials and the peoples who were in every one of King Asheroth's provinces. For the queen's actions will become public knowledge to all the women and cause them to despise their husbands. And say, King Arash, King Arashas ordered Queen Vashti brought before him, but she did not come. Before this day is over, the noble women of Persia and Media who hear about the queen's act will say the same thing to all the king's officials, resulting in more contempt and fury. If it meets the king's approval, he should personally issue a royal decree. Let it be recorded in the laws of Persian media so that it cannot be revoked. Vashti is not to enter King Asherah's presence, and her royal position is to be given to another woman who is more worthy than she. The decree the king issues will be heard throughout the vast kingdom, so all women will honor their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his counselors approved the proposal, and they followed Mimikon's advice. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to each province in its own script, and each ethnic group in its own language, that every man should be master of his own house and speak in the language of his own people. King Xerxes was wrong in what he did. He threw a drunken party. He embarrassed himself by making a foolish request of his wife. And he was rather further humiliated because the queen had more decorum than he. And became so furious that he tried to save face by following the chauvinistic and foolish advice of his cabinet. What the king did was foolish. He threw a party, showing off his wealth and his splendor. A drunken party. And in the midst of the party, he had his queen summoned and wanted her brought before uh, the banquet hall, wearing her crown. Now, in a sense, what he did was encouraging and almost flattering because he was showing off the treasures of his kingdom, the things that he valued most. And evidently, he valued his queen and treasured her for her beauty. Oh, every woman should feel that she is a queen in the eyes of her husband. Every woman should feel that she is treasured and honored and loved by her husband. And Jesus said, uh, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Oh, men, we have a responsibility to honor and to love our wives, to let them know that they are treasured and respected. But considering her a treasure, the way that he displayed it and showed it off was wrong and humiliating. You see, in that culture and in that society, the women were very modest. And the, the greater your affluence, the more important that you were, the more modest you were. You kept yourself covered and often hidden. And often those most respected in the country did not go out very often in public. They were secretive, secluded, and protected. And in the midst of his drunken party, the king said, Bring my wife. Bring the queen in her crown. I want to show her off. King Xerxes made a bad decision. It was wrong. 
because he was ruled by pride. Verse 12 tells us, But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious, and his anger burned within him. When the queen refused to come, the king was overwhelmed with anger. His goal here was to impress people with how important he was. And he made a dumb decision to get rid of his queen. And that decision stemmed from his ego. He made a foolish request of his wife, an unmannerly, unkind, and disrespectful request for her to appear before the drunken mob. He wants her in that culture to do something that was considered immodest. And gentlemen, we are never to do anything that will dishonor our wives. We are to not do things that will cause them to feel less than loved, honored, or respected. And that is both in public and in private. I kid about my wife a lot, but I want you to understand I know what a gift she is and what a helpmeet she is. And when I kid and I joke about my wife, people know I'm lying through my teeth. And the king asked something of, her, of his wife that would bring her down in the eyes of her subjects and would lower their opinion of her. And then he gets angry because she has better sense than he does. Pride often initiates and flames and intensifies anger. That's why it's such a big mistake to invest in pride. Whatever I invest in becomes what I'm committed to. Once the king had invested so deeply in his pride, he had committed himself to self-glorification and self-honor. He became so self-focused that he had no clue as to what his request would mean to his wife. We all have those momentary lapses in judgment when we think too highly of ourselves. And the key is to not let this false impression of ourselves last. Don't build them up. Don't invest in them. When we feel foolish pride swelling up inside us, we need to follow, follow that old adage of swallowing our pride. But notice also, it is wrong to allow the devil to divide. Here's a king and a queen. The king thought his wife was beautiful. And usually in most situations and circumstances, the king has been very protective of his wife. And we know that because of the way he reacted when his queen Esther was insulted later. He had the man who did so hung. But in this instance, he allowed his pride and hurt feelings to cause a division between he and his bride. And let me tell you, my friends, when there are hurt feelings and a separation between you and someone that you're normally close to or protective of, you need to check out the situation because the devil is lurking in the shadows somewhere close. The devil loves to divide. There in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God would come down and walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. There was a closeness. There was a relationship. There was an intimacy not known until Christ came again. And then the devil came and whispered his words to Eve. Has God truly said? And through the work of the devil on that day, there was a separation between mankind and God. God said, what have you done? Because of the work of the devil that day, there was a separation between Adam and his wife Eve. He said, Lord, the woman you gave me. Anytime there was division, and separation, you can rest assured that the devil is hard at work. And a 
Ephesians chapter 4 beginning in verse 1 we read therefore I the prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness with patience accepting one another in love diligently keeping the unity of the spirit with the peace that binds us there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope at your calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in all. The Holy Spirit, when He is working, brings unity. It is the devil who brings division. And it doesn't take very much, does it? A word spoken incorrectly or taken the wrong way. You know, when you're around people a lot, you work with people. You live with people. There are going to be occasions when you say something and it's taken the wrong way. Or you say something in the wrong way. And the closer you are to a person and the more often you are around them, the more likely it is that that's going to occur. I have a friend. She and I have an understanding that if we say something and it can be taken one of two ways it can be taken in a way that ticks you off or another way that doesn't we've agreed to give each other the benefit of the doubt to assume that the other person meant it in the right way and not in a way that upsets us my friends the Bible says it is to our advantage to overlook an offense and you can rest assured when there are hurt feelings and separations and divisions among people who are normally close or working together or functioning together when there is division between friends or at home or in the church you can rest assured that the devil is lurking and working in the shadows nearby for the Holy Spirit brings unity and it is the devil and his henchmen that causes division and the devil was alive and well and working in the palace that day. I want you to understand it is also a mistake to borrow bitterness. What is the first thing the king did when the queen turned down his insulting idea? He immediately consulted with his advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs for he always asked their advice. Now what's wrong with that picture? Man, we, we need counselors and advisors. We need people to, to help us. To help us through difficult situations, generally speaking. It is wise to, to seek others' counsel and guidance. But in this situation, he was not asking the right people. What the king was looking for was for someone to confirm what he believed. To tell him that he was in the right I think he was doing the same thing we've all done before. He asked these guys because he knew that they would tell him what he wanted to hear. He got those closest to him to give him counsel because he knew they thought just like he did. He wanted them to join him in his anger. The purpose of this party that he was throwing was to show off his majesty and his splendor and all of the things that he had accumulated to stoke his ego. And here when the queen turned him down, his ego took a hit. I want to pause here and insert something about relationships. It is never right to make requests of others that humiliate, degenerate, or in any way exploit them. Chuck Swindoll says about the queen's refusal to her husband's abusive request, I admire Queen Vashti. In the midst of an unsavior, unsavory scene, she was brave enough to say no to that which was blatantly wrong. And in resisting this insulting act of indignity, she took a stand against the greatest power in her universe. Good for her. Submission does not mean that a wife is a sexual pawn in the carnal desires of her husband. It was never God's design that a wife submit to her husband's evil desires. 
In the king's case, this took the form of desiring to display her before those who would have nothing in mind but lust. What he asked was not submission, it was indecency. And the queen made a courageous decision. Marriage does not give a husband the right or the license to fulfill his basest fantasies by insulting or abusing his wife. Be careful, men, what you ask of the woman that God has given you. Be certain that it doesn't assault her dignity as a person or turn a precious human being created in God's image into a sexual object for your own carnal gratification. We're all created in the image of God to be honored, to be respected, to be shown dignity and love. The king went to his cabinet and he said, what do you think? What do we need to do? Men said, well, king, here's what's happening. If you let her get away with this, the word's going to get out all over the kingdom. And every wife and every household in the whole blooming kingdom, they're all going to say, I don't have to listen to my husband anymore. I can do what I want to. I can respond the way that I want to. So, king, here's what you need to do. You need to pass a law saying that the queen can never come into your presence again. And you need to select a new queen. That's quite an overreaction. But the king falls for it because it's precisely what he wanted to hear. Be careful about picking people to give you advice. Especially if they're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. Be careful about listening to bitter people. The people that you need counsel from. Those that you need to listen to are those that you know have a walk with the Lord. Who spend time with Him on a, on a regular basis. The people that you need to have around you as counselors are men and women of God. Who you know are going to tell you the truth. Tom's one of my counselors. He listens to me when I'm ticked. And he keeps his mouth shut. He doesn't go sharing with the world what he knows. And that's a great quality to have in a friend and an advisor. But one of the things he does that both helps and irritates me <laughs> is that he often tries to give me a different perspective. He says, Gene, do you think maybe, or have you thought about it like this? Perhaps they meant, I hate it when he does that. <laughs> He tells me what I need to hear and gives godly counsel and that's why I go back to him. But that doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> I want someone who's going to agree with me and say that, Gene, you're right and everyone else is wrong. I want someone around me who's going to say, I agree with you. I can't believe how wrong that other person was. And we can find yes men and yes women just like that. But what you need is a godly counselor. Who's not going to jump on the bandwagon. Who's going to seek to look at the situation from God's perspective. And look, when you're angry and bitter, it isn't difficult to find people in the same boat who will join right in with you. It's not difficult to read between the lines and see the bitterness and insecurity of the king's counselors. These guys were not fit to lead the kingdom. They didn't even know how to lead their own homes. You don't lead by a dictatorship. Oh, you can get what you want for a while. But you can't have loving, lasting relationships without leading people by example and respect. The king was proud. And his pride led to anger. And then they listened to a bunch of bitter guys, men who obviously didn't get it. They said, pass a law 
Make it legal for a man to say whatever he wants to, to his wife. And then make it where she'll get into trouble if she stands up to him. If you follow that kind of advice in your relationships, that kind of bitterness will backfire on you. Anger is like a splinter in your finger. If you leave it there, it gets infected and hurts every time you use your finger. If you remove it, it hurts for a while. But after a while, you feel better. Don't borrow bitterness. Don't let someone else's unresolved anger invade your life. It kills relationships. Wrong things to do when I'm angry and depressed. Invest in anger. Allow the devil to divide. Borrow bitterness. And fourth, it's a mistake to trade relationships. Verse 19. If it meets the king's approval, he should personally issue a royal decree. Let it be recorded in the laws of Persian media so that it cannot be revoked. Vashti is not to enter the king's presence and her royal position is to be given to another woman who is more worthy than she. Let me preface this point by saying I'm not trying to bring up anyone's past sins. Some of you have gone through very painful and heartbreaking ends to relationships in your past. And please know that I know, and more importantly, God knows that those were in your past. We've all made mistakes in our relationships. And the king made the serious mistake of deciding to trade relationships. Oh, I, I'm feeling hurt right now. So I'm going to get rid of this queen and I'm going to get me another one. Instead of working out my problems with this queen, I'll get me another one that does exactly what I want. The queen he had wasn't unfaithful. He had no grounds for divorce. And yet he decided to trade her in for another. I'm sorry about all the marriages that have broken up. I'm sorry for some of you and some of what you've gone through. But all of us need to stand together to try and help marriages remain intact as much as possible. Our hearts need to go out to those recovering from divorce. Yet at the same time, we need to do everything in our power to see that divorce is not the answer that a lot of people think it is. Christ's followers need to be committed to making their marriages work by turning to Christ and finding ways to overcome their obstacles. What we are dealing with today is an important principle. The king made a mistake that a lot of people are making today in pride and anger and bitterness. And in response to bad advice, he ended his relationship with his wife and he sought another. God is able to take bad choices and make good out of them. I don't know, understand how he does it other than the fact that he is God. And he deserves a lot of praise for this and for so many other reasons. But the Bible says, look, God has joined together. Let no man separate. No man divide. You know, so often, we let pride and the devil and bad counsel get in our lives. And it causes us to break our promises, to destroy relationships. We see it in the broken families and homes. We see it in the broken churches. People running here and there. Believing that the next marriage, the next friendship, the next church, it'll have it all together. But let me tell you, my friends, there's no perfect marriage because there's no perfect person. And there is no perfect church because they are made up of imperfect people. 
And the devil will do all that he can to cause division and dissension. And problems between husband and wife and parents and children and brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we allow it, he will cause our pride to tear us all apart. The king made a mistake. And as a result, the queen paid a terrible price for it. Will Smith told People Magazine a while back that he and his wife, Jade Smith, had been married for 10 years. When asked how in Hollywood terms they had remained together so long, Smith replied, What I found is divorce just can't be an option. I think that's the problem with L.A. There are so many options. So a huge part of the success for Jada and, and me is that we just remove the other options. I believe that's a good platform on which to base a marriage. Both parties need to be committed to that precept. Divorce is not an option. In his book, Seven Sins of Highly Defective People, Rick Easel writes, when my wife and I were in London one spring, we discovered that some of the bombs dropped on England are still killing people. Sometimes they are discovered, sometimes blow up at construction sites, in fishing nets or on beaches more than 50 years after the war. Undetected bombs become more dangerous with time because corrosion can expose the detonator. And what is true of bombs that are not dealt with is also true of people who have unresolved anger. Buried anger explodes when we least expect it. When anger explodes, it does all sort of damage. It severs relationships, it causes ulcers, it leads to murder. When anger is turned inward, it leads to depression. When it is turned outward, it leads to aggression. So we have to deal with the anger and not bury it. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So before we go, I have a few questions to ask. Let me ask you. Are you honoring those around you? Do the things you say and do build up and encourage your spouse, your children, your co-workers and neighbors? Do they feel closer to God and respected and honored because they have been around you? Or do they feel less worthy, less loved or respected because they've been in your presence? Second, let me ask you, are you like the queen willing to pay a price for doing what is right? Third, are you allowing the devil to divide? Are you allowing pride and ego to cause a separation, a division between you and others? Have you chosen God-fearing, honest counselors? And do people have to walk on eggshells around you because they never know when you might explode? If any of those were true of you, there's business you need to do with the Lord this morning.